What's up guys? I am Laura from Reading in Bed and this is the Future Classics tag. Uh, this is a tag that is really making the rounds here on Literary Booktube as I like to think of it. Um, and I wasn't going to do it because there have been so many great responses already, um, really well considered, taking the time to really think about what a classic is and what a classic might be, that I wasn't sure that I had a lot to contribute to it. Then I was tagged by a Jennifer at insert literary pun here, so I am going to respect the tag and I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, I think a lot of my answers will be sort of non-answers though, though I do have a pile of books to show. So maybe the best way I can um, add some value here is to just link all of the videos that I have watched. And I would say the best one, um, the must watch out of the bunch is Sean the Book Maniac's response because he spends more than half of the, the video's runtime just going through what a classic is, uh, going through it. Now I'm not sure if it's a, a book or an essay, but there's sort of these 15 points of things that make up a classic, one of which I had heard of and um, resonates uh, strongly with me, which is that a classic is a book that is never finished saying what it has to say. Um, but then there's lots more and he goes really in depth into it, so it's really good. And I guess I would be remiss not to mention uh, the creator of the tag, who's Eric Carl Anderson, so obviously those will be linked as well as a bunch of others that I've watched so far. So let's get into it. Um, the first question is to pick an established classic that you think will still be relevant in the future. Um, so, so I think it's going to be all of them <laughs> because of what I, what I just mentioned to me, a classic is a book that's never finished saying what it has to say. And the books that I consider established classics tend to, uh, be about big themes like love and obsession and mortality and innocence versus guilt. And, um, you know, what does it mean to be patriotic or to subscribe to a, you know, particular belief and like these are like they're all specific to their time and place and all that but the themes are big they're themes that are never going to go away and um if they're an established classic uh it's i believe because they're not done saying what they have to say and really won't ever be done having uh something to say about those themes so so yeah that's my first non-answer no i would say for an alternative point of view on this um i'm gonna oh my cat's just topped up. Uh, we'll see if we can continue on. Uh, for an alternative view on this, I'm going to direct you to a Goodreads review from a uh, beloved booktuber, Barry Pierce. Uh, and he, <laughs> he gave a one-star review to an Ernest Hemingway book. And then, of course, a Hemingway bro came for him and he just, you know, annihilated him in the response. So, and Barry's thing was that, uh, like the person who responded said like, oh, how dare you? How can you disrespect an author that's been so well loved and blah, blah, blah. And Barry said, well, you know what? Um, the tide is turning on that. And it's not going to be only about uh, the old dead white dudes. And we thankfully now have many more types of books to choose from. And while I, I certainly agree and um, like I get what he's saying, but I don't think like there's always going to be Hemingway bros, <laughs> I guess. And I'm kind of okay with that. I mean, I've... Uh, I, I could only find this one. I, I've read Hemingway. I'm I'm okay with him. I think he's still going to be around. I don't think he's going anywhere. Whether or not he should, maybe that's a different question. Um, but anyways, so let's move on to the second question, which is to pick a recent book which you feel has gone under the radar, but which you are confident will be a future classic. So I do have an actual pick for this one. It's The Story of a Brief Marriage by Anouk Arud Pergasm. Um, so this, now when did this come out? Fairly recently, I want to say 2017, 2016. Um, and it didn't win any major awards. I did have to go and check. It was shortlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize, which I'm not even really familiar with. And then it just had a bunch of, it made a lot of the sort of best of the year and top 10 lists on like Buzzfeed and stuff like that. Um, but to me, it's, it, it missed the boat on getting some real, uh, like legit kind of establishment recognition. Um, the story of a brief marriage is, uh, it's a really short book. It's, uh, very heavy, both in subject matter and writing style. Um, but it's just heartbreaking. It's beautiful. It's tragic. Uh, it's based on, um, the the conflict and civil war in Sri Lanka and uh, the the people who were displaced by that and the um, you know horrible violence and massacres that happened there but it's not like it's not um, sentimental about it I guess like it, it's 
I don't know, it's a really hard book to describe. And I guess the reason this came to mind was really uh, sort of in opposition uh, almost to this book, which is The Boat People by Sharon Bala, which is about also about Tamil people from Sri Lanka. In this book, it's specifically about um, those who uh, make their way to Canada, so become refugees. In this book, uh, the people stay in Sri Lanka, so you can't really call them refugees. They're displaced, I guess. Um, but the boat people, uh, it hasn't won anything big yet, but I have a feeling it's going to win Canada Reads. It, uh, it's been tipped for some sort of, um, not a prize, but like a one book, one country sort of thing in the UK. Because I was like, I was starting to see this on UK book bloggers and UK uh, booktubers. And I was like, why are they reading this? Canadian book that didn't really, um, it just seemed to come out of nowhere, but it seems like this book is going to get a huge push. And so, you know, sort of similar subjects, but this one, yeah, I, I have issues. I did, I did like it, but the writing is just, it's okay. There are issues. There's, um, there's a lot of showing, uh, like telling rather than showing. There's a lot of, uh, there's cliches to me like it, it does get better as it goes and she really sticks the landing so I'll give her that but this book is just uh, like it's beyond it's exquisite although <laughs> I will mention that um, there's like a seven page description of someone taking a shit in here and <laughs> I mean the book's not even 200 pages so that's a fairly big percentage so like if you're not into super literary descriptions of um of bodily functions and stuff, then like maybe don't. Um, but to me, like this is the book. If you're gonna read a book, uh, you wanna read a book about the Sri Lankan Civil War and uh, and about what it's like to live through that, this is the book to read and it's not the book that's being pushed or uh, championed right now. So um, hopefully, like it's under the radar now and I, I hope it gets recognized in the future. Okay, so question number three is to pick a title that won one of your favorite book prizes recently and that you think will still be lauded in 50 years time. Um, so my, my go-to answer for this, now the book prize that I'm uh, considering is the Giller Prize. Now, <laughs> I went back and I looked at all the winners since the year 2000, which is arguably not that recent, but like most of them are really just like, I don't know if this is going to be lauded in five years, <laughs> to be quite honest. But the one that sticks out um, is 15 Dogs by Andre Alexis. Uh, I love this book. It's really well written. It's... Um, I guess it's not a wholly original. I mean, if you've read Animal Farm, it, it's sort of in that vein, but not really, uh, where we do have dogs that have been bestowed with human consciousness. And, and then we, and it does have like kind of a political slant. We see like how they uh, sort of align themselves in different camps and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, for me, that's kind of why I think it will stick around because it is sort of universal in that way that it, it doesn't, it's not stuck in, um, in a particular uh, ideology, I guess. Like it is quite specific to a time and place. Like it's very specific to Toronto. Um, but yeah, like I, I think, again, like going back to what I think a classic is, there's big themes here big, uh, you know, sort of revelations that um, you can come to as a reader if you want to, or you can just kind of read it for the, the novelty of it being about dogs that can talk and think and stuff. Um, so this one I think will stick around. Uh, and apart from that, I think uh, I'm going to just give some props to The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje. Even though it's a very difficult book, it's not really my favorite book. However, the hype around his upcoming book, uh, which is called Warlight, is is kind of big. So I, I can see just like as a body of work, I think he is going to stand the test of time and stick around. Um, so uh, the next question is to pick a recent book that you haven't read yet, but which you think might become a classic based on reputation alone. Um, the first one that came to mind was Lincoln and the Bardo, which I have read some of, but I DNF'd. <laughs> But I mean, like people are just, there are some people who also didn't like it, but they're few and far between. Most people love it. Most people go beyond loving it. They're, you know, like in, um, like writhing in ecstasy when they speak about it. So yeah, I mean, I get it. And, uh, and I don't think it's going anywhere either. Um, the other one I wanted to pick is, is another sort of under the radar one. So this is Ice Fields by Thomas Wharton, which I have not read yet. Um, I have read a subsequent book that he wrote called Every Blade of Grass, which I loved. Uh, it was kind of on, like, 
I think maybe, I, I don't know about this one, but there were some themes about like climate, like there's this whole little subgenre of climate literature, but it was also, again, big themes, uh, you know, parenthood and loss and grieving and stuff like that. Um, and this book came to mind because of a recent review from a book blogger over at another book blogger. <laughs> that was awkward how I said that, but Rick at another book blogger recently reviewed this and in his review he didn't even really reference the plot. Uh, he just talked about what it meant to him, which is again another way that I look at classics. Um, like the actual plot, the actual uh, you know timeline of what happens in the book is way less important than what the book means to us as individual readers and what it means like in the context of um, of, you know, the canon or that country's literature or whatever. So I got the feeling from reading his review, which I will link below, um, that this is that kind of a book. And hopefully, I mean, I really do need to get to this. Uh, so last question is to pick a favorite book that you want to save for your grandchildren. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how to take this question if it meant like a particular edition that I want to pass down as an heirloom. And I don't, I'm not really big on uh, like fetishizing books as physical objects. Like to me, uh, you know, we've all, we've got our e-readers, our books are in the clouds and, um, or the cloud. <laughs> uh, and you know, as far as my grandchildren or other people's grandchildren, who knows what it's going to look like. So in one way, I don't like, I, I say like nothing really, um, they'll have their own tastes and they can read whatever. And, you know, calling back to my previous response, I don't think the canon is going anywhere. So my beloved classics, I believe will still be available. Um, I also thought about it in terms of children's books and the books that I've saved, like not editions of, but just saved up and started reading to my kids as they're getting a little older. Um, and the thing with all of those, uh, like I'm thinking of The Secret Garden in particular, as well as others, is once you start reading those children's classics to your kids, you realize that they're all really fucked up. Like they're good and kids still like them. Like my kids love The Secret Garden, which I didn't, I wasn't sure if they would. Um, but you know, like many other classics, they're often uh, very racist, very sexist. Um, and, and there's often stuff in there that you're like, like, this is going to go way over a kid's head. What is this doing in here? Uh, but, but somehow they still work. And I don't, I don't really quite understand that. Um, so, so yeah, th this is my most non-answer because I'm not even, I'm not really sure how to answer it. And either of those two answers, I don't really have a great response for. I hope that if I have grandkids, I just, hope that they love reading. My kids, um, my older child who's eight in particular is, is re just getting into reading now um, where he is harassing me and begging me to read him more and more chapters every night before bed, which is annoying, but it's also really cool. So, um, so yeah, I think that's it. So it's just five questions. Uh, thank you to Jennifer for tagging me. Thanks to Eric for creating the tag. Thanks to everyone who's done it. I love it when these things kind of go viral in our little corner of booktube. And uh, thank you for watching.